Alan, thank you for leading us in that song. It, uh, know why the Lord gives a song, because your mind goes back to things that you just normally aren't thinking of. Uh, in our previous work, where Amory and I were, there was a dear sister who was a widow, and she didn't have any family. And as she had received the news that she was uh, sadly going to be passing away, she needed help in planning her, uh, her memorial service, so we were doing that. And one of the songs that she wanted sung was that one. And that was what we sang, well, one of the songs that we sang at her memorial. Uh, her, her name was Eva Grace Frelish. And I just, every time that that song is sung, besides the words, I have that memory to come into my mind. And how time indeed is too short for us to have ill will towards others. And how time is indeed too short for us to keep it going. And that instead to use the gift of words to be a blessing to someone else, whatever it is that they need to hear, that we need to be conduits, we need to be sources of things to build up and not tear down, and uh, to use our time wisely in that, that manner. Matt and Jessica, John, Heather, you and your family, thank you both for choosing this church family. We appreciate you doing that, and we are very, very encouraged that that you have done that. And as far as our guests, we want you to know how honored we are that you're with us. And we want you to know how humbled and encouraged we are that you are with us. We're humbled because we recognize the gift that God has given you in, for, in the form of time. And you're choosing to give some of that time to this congregation. And we're very thankful for that. And we're encouraged that you're here. And we're encouraged that you are seeking God, that you are looking for God, that you want to draw near to God. And if our congregation can help you in any way, if you have any questions or if there's something that we can do to be of an encouragement, let us, let us know. And a few months ago, a sister was a, an individual that we met through our new movers was baptized in the Christ, Miss Alicia Arias. And she is here with us for the first time this morning, and we're thankful for that. We know that there's been a lot of obstacles in her way in being able to join us, but sister, we're glad you're with us here this morning. So two weeks ago, we started this series that we've entitled House Rules. Uh, and the genesis of this was just taking a, a survey of the landscape of our congregation and how we have we've grown. This year alone, Lord has added to his family 12 who have responded to the good news of Christ. They repented and were baptized. And that's always, always worth noting. And it's always worth Honoring God and praising God for his work because we're reminded of the graciousness and the love of our Lord and what he desires for everyone to do. We've also had several families placing membership, several guests, and it was just a good time to go back as a congregation and to be reminded of the things that we want to live by, things that we want to have uh, to continue to grow. Uh, rules are not meant, even though they may be taken this way and employed this way, they're not meant to, to enforce uh, legalism on someone. We're not advocating church police and looking for those who are going to find the, know the rules and then find those who are breaking them. That's not the purpose of this. No, the, what rules are, for ask any teacher and she or he will have classroom rules because the ultimate goal of the classroom is to be a place of learning. And the rules help that purpose to be fulfilled. Any of us that have jobs and we go into the office, even post-COVID, you have workplace rules, if you will, because your employers want, want your place of business or your place of employment to be, produ to be productive, uh, to accomplish the goals and whatever else that the company or the business is that you have. It's the same for us. That we need to remember that God's, God has a twofold purpose for his congregation. That each local church has an external purpose. That we take the good news of Jesus and Jesus himself and we lift it up and we share it, we preach it, we teach it, we proclaim it. God wants the world to hear the good news. And the church is the vehicle and how that happens. That is our external purpose. Internally, God wants us to be a community that continues to build each other up community that continues to encourage, that pours into one another, whether it's through our words, whether it's through our actions, whether it's through acts of service, it doesn't matter that we are constantly building one another up so that when we gather together at a time like this or some other point in time that is used, 
that we leave better. We leave full of love. We, feel, we leave full of grace and mercy. We leave full and re, uh, uh, reignited for the passion and the purpose of God. In the early 60s of the first century, the apostle Peter is writing to a group of Christians who have been scattered because of persecution. They've been scattered to some to the far edges of the Roman Empire at the time. A lot of things that are going on, and it's really a letter about hope. But as with any other letter in the New Testament, there are always second, uh, secondary reasons, things that you can glean and things that you can learn. And he reminds them that as they're going to different places and they're fulfilling the external purpose to lift up Jesus so that all men can hear him and know him and ultimately follow him, that when the gospel is preached, when people are, are, repent and are baptized, the church is born and it's formed. But God does something when that happens. And Peter says this, that you yourselves, whether you are together or you're scattered and you're meeting in homes, it does not matter. You yourselves are being built up as a spiritual house. That we are the living stones of God. Each member having a place, strategically placed, not by elders or deacons or members, but God himself. Knowing the talents that he's given us, knowing the resources that he's given us, that he places us exactly where we need to be in the body. But here's for that internal purpose, that every member, that from this side to this side and everyone in between, that we are being joined together so that we can build up the house of God. And two weeks ago, we talked about love. It's the first rule in God's house. Among the living stones that are being joined together. Being reminded that as these stones are being put. One on top of another. One side by side. That love. Love is the mortar that holds these together. That love. Whether it's revealed in patience or kindness. Love that if, if it's revealed in keeping no record of wrongs. Love that is not going to end. It is the mortar that holds us together. That what does it look like for every living stone of our church family to be committed to love? And it's not just love in how I feel. And it isn't even just love in what I choose to do. But most importantly, it is a love that is willing to sacrifice just like Jesus. So in that sermon, we ask this question, how many of us as living stones as part of this group, part of this family, how many of us want to be a house that is more loving? And everybody shook their head up and down, even if a hand wasn't raised. Then the next question became this then. If everybody wants to have a family, a house that is built to be more loving, then how sacrificial are we ready to be? How sacrificial are we ready to be for one another? That there is no such thing as an inconvenient time for one another. That there is no such thing as something being withheld from one another. That there is no such thing that is off the table for consideration. That if it is best for us, if it is best for God's house that is being built up, and we are the living stones that God is using to do that, and we want to be built up as a family, Love, then how sacrificial are we ready to be? And then the rest of the sermon was given. Basing or using that as our foundation. There are other things that come in. Rules that we need to live by. Things that stem or spring, if you will, from love. And one of the qualities that the Apostle Paul gave in 1 Corinthians 13 is that love rejoices in the truth. So years prior to Jesus coming onto the scene and the church being established and the apostles teaching and preaching and so forth and so on, the wisest man of his time stood up and said that one of the wisest things that any individual can do is that if he finds or if she comes across the truth, then buy it. Buy the truth. And not only buy the truth, but don't sell it. 
Don't put it on the auction block. Don't put it on a website. Don't say that this is up for sale. No, that truth is so valuable that it's actually priceless. One of the things that we need to know is God's family, that we are being built on as the living stones, is that we need to know that truth matters in God's house. So Apostle Paul will put it this way. And for those of you that have been with us on Sunday night, as we're working through these pastoral epistles, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy, in a setting of a church nonetheless, that is being swerved away from the faith, and swerving away from the truth, he tells Timothy this, that the church of the living God is a pillar and a buttress of the truth. That it is there As a support system. The church doesn't have a monopoly on truth. The church doesn't have something in terms of the truth to hold to itself. The church's responsibility, the living stones that are being built up as God's house. That our purpose is to take what God has revealed. and To lift it up so that men can know what to do. They can know God. They can know His Son Jesus. They can know of the Holy Spirit that would indwell within them. They can know of the word that you hold in your hand. They can know truth. So I just want to read something for you. Just a little bit of a mental exercise if that's okay. So I I made a Google search this week. And in the search bar I put this phrase, truth in modern day America. Truth in modern day America. Yeah, somebody said, wow, that's what I did. You just look at the pages that are there. So I just want to read uh, two confessions that I need to to go ahead and tell you. One, I did not read the articles. I just looked at the names, so I broke all the rules and just stopped at the the article. But I I still think that there's something there about the headline. After all, it's supposed to catch your attention. So I, I want to see what you have for this. And then the other is just to go ahead and know that some of these have a political slant to, slant to them. So take it with a grain of salt in the way that it is as well. But this is just, if you put in the search bar, truth in modern day America, here are some of the results, just as the headlines are concerned that come up. From Pew Research, which was the very first result that came up, the headline read, quote, Americans struggle with truth, accuracy, and accountability. Boston College was the second one they had, and it was an article put out by the college itself, and it said, Welcome to Post-Truth America. USA Today was the third one. How can Americans find truth in an age of doubt? The fourth one, the cause of America's post-truth predicament. Time magazine had a a magazine published earlier this this year, quote, the era of self-evident truth is over. The Atlantic, how America has lost its mind. And there are others, and time just does not allow us to be able to do it, but if you were to just stick there again and not read anything, and I'd encourage you to obviously read stuff, let's just make sure we don't stop at headlines, let's do our due diligence, let's be intellectually honest with the things that come our way. At the same time, You just to take that survey and you were to walk, get up from your chair and walk away, what would you determine about truth in the 21st century of our country? Truth. We're struggling. We're struggling. Some of it's self inflicted, some of it is just a refusal, some of it is just because we don't like it. And yes, truth is supposed to be inconvenient. And truth is supposed to be uncomfortable. And truth is supposed to be challenging. That's okay. That's all right. But out of all the places that exist right now, whether you want to call them institutions, whether we want to call them organizations, or if we want to call them churches, God's plan for the local church of the living stones being built up is to be a pillar and a buttress of the truth. To not be built on opinions, to not be built on how I see or how I feel or what I think, 
but to be built on God's truth that has been revealed once and for all. So just three things, if you will, this morning, just for us to consider when it comes to truth. And the first thing is this. Normally we would begin with Scripture. But let's begin with the one that Scripture reveals. Do you know what the, tr- what, what the church lifts up as the truth for all the world? And it's done it for 2,000 years. It's this, that over 2,000 years ago, a miracle happened. Truth came down from heaven, became flesh and blood, and lived among us. The Apostle John begins his gospel in these ways. In the beginning was the Word, he says. And going down to verse 14, he says, This Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And as people interacted with him, whether they were individuals or whether they were crowds, there was something that they noticed about this individual, that grace and truth came from him. The church, as a pillar and a buttress, lifts up Jesus for all time, in all places, for all people. And we are gathered together to remember him. That he did come, and that he did live, and that people heard him, people saw him, people touched him, people ate with him, people did all sorts of things. But truth came down over 2,000 years ago, and it is our responsibility as the living stones being built up as God's house to take that message and to say, you can know, his, you can know the truth, and his name is Jesus. And what's amazing about that last statement with grace and truth is that it goes right into the face of some of the struggles we're having with our society today. We think falsely that it's either grace or it's truth, that you can't have either one. And Jesus comes down and says, you actually can have both. If we get out of balance and we have too much grace and we have too much love in the way that society or the world around us would define it, then what ends up happening is that even though people are, are left with a warm feeling, if you will, they're also left in self-denial. Truth breaks through. Whether it's Nicodemus who comes at night to a woman at the well who's going out in the mid-afternoon, both needed to hear, God loves you, And that God did not send His Son in the world to condemn you. But if you reject the Son, you're condemned already. That's what Charlie read for us earlier. That grace and truth do coexist. And where we're being told that it can't, the church lifts up and says, absolutely they can, because it did. It existed. They coexisted in Jesus. And the church must be a witness that grace and truth does coexist. And if we continue to root ourselves in Him, we won't get out of balance as we see other things getting out of balance. We won't be as unstable unstable as others are unstable. That grace and truth exist. And the church is willing to lift that up and say, here it is. And you can know both. It's not an either or. It's a both and. We want to be a community built on grace. We, after all, are saved by grace. No work among ourselves or from ourselves earned us a place in the God's table, in the God's kingdom. But we also lift up truth because we were told we were in darkness and God has come to shed light. We can lift up both in terms of grace and truth. So Paul will tell Timothy something amazing about all of this some 30 years after Jesus embodies grace and truth. That God desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of what? The truth. I want you to come to a knowledge of it. In an age that says we're not really sure where we can go for truth, we're not even really sure if we can know the truth, here comes God through Christ and says, come to Jesus and you'll find truth. And come to Jesus and you can know it. So much so that you can know it to the point where you are free which is what he says. 
that the living stones being built up, that is his spiritual house, that we are committed to this as much as Jesus was committed to it. That we will build ourselves on top of things that cannot be negotiated. Things that cannot be swept under the rug. Things that cannot be conveniently ignored unless we ignore them to our own peril. Now we, we're willing to lift up grace and truth because when the whole world wasn't looking for it, God sent it. It's Jesus. Church, we can, we can know the truth and we can lift it up if we will start first and foremost with our Savior, who is also our Lord, who is also our wonderful Counselor and our Prince of Peace, who is our everlasting Father. But there's something else that Paul will tell the church in Ephesus through Timothy, something that we've been studying. But I want to kind of lead into it this way. How many of us would categorize ourselves as risk takers? Like taking a risk? There's one. Okay. One. Risk takers. And there's a lot. And maybe we, we would like a risk. Maybe it's off to a new job. Maybe it's off to a new place to live. Whatever it may be. I, if those of us that have five-year-olds, you would know what a risk taker is because there is nothing that, that, is, that puts fear in five-year-olds or eight-year-olds or ten-year-olds or what have you. For the most part, we are not risk takers. We like things, we don't want surprises. We want to make sure that things line up. We want to try to remain as in control as we possibly can. All of us share that trait. As much as we may not verbalize it, we do share that trait. Church, as God's family that's being built up, one of the great risks that we can take, one of the great risks that we can take as a body, is to have a Bible, but it remains closed more often than it does open. That's one of the great risks that we can take in our time. That as a family that's being built up, again for the purpose of sharing the good news that is Jesus and of Jesus, the only way that's shared is to know what this says. But the more this is closed, as opposed to open, it quickly, can quickly descend to where we find ourselves moving away from God instead of closer. One of the great risks that we can take as a group, one of the great risks that we can take as individuals, is that this is the only, di the only day of the week, the only time of the week in which a Bible is even remotely open. Stay in your Bible. Stay in God's word. That even though it is here to lift up Jesus and to reveal Jesus, it's still got to be open. It still needs to be known. It still needs to be read. And with all the struggles that are happening around us, we need to be reminded that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Able, says God. It's, it's got the capability to divide even the bone from the marrow. If it can do that, do you think that it can divide all the mud and all the mire and all the weeds that we wade in every single day? Do you think it has the ability? Do you know that it has the ability that God has infused it from Himself because it is God breathed that it has the ability to keep us grounded when everything else is being so intrusive? Heard that earlier this week within a sermon that I was listening to. And it's one of those that we know, but it just hit, hit me like a ton of bricks when I was listening to it. Think of how much our society is intrusive on us. From our phones in our pocket, to 24-hour news programming, to podcasts. All these things are great, nothing wrong with them. I listen to them, I hope you listen to things. I hope you're wise in what you choose to listen to. Do you realize how intrusive things are? Even now, you've probably felt your phone buzzing with notifications and messages and other types of things. The most intrusive thing in our life needs to be God and His Word. It needs to have the most prominent place. This is why Paul tells Timothy, for the church that he's writing to, until I come, until that happens, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and to teaching. That among the things that needs to happen when we come together, that we need to keep that regular appointment. And part of that is so that we can devote ourselves to what's happening at this moment. 
that what happened from 9.30 to about 10.15 with the study of God's Word, with all the hundreds of voices, including my own, that have listened to this week, I need His voice. And you do too. But what happens to a church that forgets Him? Do you know such a church exists? It's the church of Laodicea. The only church in the New Testament on which Jesus is outside of His church and not on the inside. He comes to him and says, Behold, I'm knocking. I'm knocking. He's asking for permission to come into His family. The one who bled, the one who died, who gave his life so that the church could be born and established and purchased by God, is asking for permission to come in. And yet the same thing happens for us, that he very well is asking for permission in our own heart, in our own life. Don't take the risk of having a closed Bible for the rest of this week. Be in it. There are other things that are competing. And they want our heart and our mind. We need to have them. And the last thing is this. What good is it to have the truth? What good is it to know the truth if we're never going to practice it? What good is it for us to have it? What good is it for us to know it? What good is it for us to have given some time today to study it? But we never practice it. So John writes to the church, I like to how the New Living Translation put it, how happy I was, he says, to meet some of your children, he's speaking to the church, and find them living according to the truth. It warmed my soul, he says. It brought joy to my heart that not only did I meet some of the Christians that went and attended together, and joined together. But even more than that, that they had built their lives individually and as a church according to the truth. We need to do the same. We need to make sure that we, as a group, that if, if all we're going to do is promote the truth, if all we're going to do is just verbally talk about it, if all we're going to do is say, come and study it so you can know it, but never have the intention for us to live it out, the truth is rendered powerless. As a matter of fact, probably today, the audience that we would gain for the outside world isn't going to come from verbal actions, from verbal words. It's not going to come verbally. It's going to be because we have committed ourselves to the truth. We want to live according to it. So another statement that I heard this week that I just thought was amazing, I wrote it down myself, how many of you have always wanted for something, just think of whatever it is, and you have said to yourself, boy, I wish this would make a difference in so-and-so's life. Have you ever thought about that? We all have. Whatever it is, money, education path, whatever. I wish that blank would make a difference. This speaker said, if we want something to make a difference in someone else's life, it's got to first make a difference in our life. All right, that's great. That's great. You want truth to make a difference? It's got to make a difference in our life first. And how do we know that it's made a difference? We've heard it with our ears. We've taken it into our heart. And we've committed to live according to God's truth. We can't speak for everyone else. We can have wishes. We can have wants. We can have desires. We can even pray about it. All are good. But perhaps the difference we want something to make in someone else's life is not meeting its intended purpose because it first hasn't made a difference in ours. It's got to make a difference. It's got to make a difference individually, but also needs to make a difference among us. So with all of that said, what, what do we need to do with this? As we put a bow on this, as we tie it up, I hope it's something that has given you a lot of food for thought. But what do we do? Well, there is a beginning place. And it's this. The Corinthian church was a church that had swerved in a lot of different ways. For whatever reason, they were a church that perhaps they had closed Bibles. 
And because of that, and they had forgotten Christ. And because of that, they had division. They suffered from abuse of communion. Members were suing one another in a court. All kinds of things that were going on. But perhaps the thing that describes them more than any other is what Paul reveals in the second letter. Something that we need to be aware of ourselves. That if truth came down in Jesus, and it did, and it's fully revealed in Him through all that He said and all that He did, and it was, and that it's been recorded for all time in a book that we know of as the Bible, and God breathed it out, then what is it that's keeping it? What's standing in the way? And perhaps... It's the same thing that was standing in the way of the Corinthian church. It wasn't a Bible that was closed. It wasn't a sermon that wasn't preached. It wasn't a study that was undertaken. But it was a heart. For whatever reason, that was closed. So Paul tells the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 11 uh, chapter 6 and verses 11 through 13. Oh, Corinthian friends. Open your hearts to us. Friends, family, this morning, and every day that God gives, open your heart, first and foremost, to Christ and the truth of God's Word. Whatever is standing in the way, it's now time to let it go. Whatever is keeping truth, from taking root to where love can rejoice in it and love can support it and it can be proclaimed. This morning, the invitation is to open your heart. Open your heart to God. Open your heart to truth. And if you do, and you have not become a Christian yet, perhaps the response is to repent and be baptized and have your sin washed away. Peter says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. The truth is yours. I hope that you'll buy it this morning and that you won't sell it as we stand and as we sing.